I have stated many times how nobody comes to us for a physical reason. Nobody starts an exercise program without some mental aspect. But did you know that exercise is also one of the best treatments for the most common mental disorder? New studies in exercise and anxiety today on the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast. Welcome to the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast with Garrett Williamson. Health, wellness, exercise, nutrition, and a whole lot more. Got questions? Call us and leave a message at 251-278-EDGE or message us at Personal Edge Fitness on Facebook and Instagram at Team PE on Twitter or PersonalEdgeFitness.com. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Now, if you're a fan of the program or a client of ours or, of course, one of my trainers, you are not foreign to the idea that I am a huge student of the mental side of exercise and the mental side of training. It's something I'm fascinated by because as I've said many, many times that nobody comes to us for a physical reason. There's a mental aspect to starting an exercise program. I've given examples about this before, but to make it simple, think about it. You may have a shoulder, a a rotator cuff problem, probably the, the most common injury that we see. You may have a rotator cuff problem, but it may or may not bother you enough to actually do something about it. Oh, it may bother you, but if you don't feel the need to exercise, you don't actually take action, you're not going to. Even though you have a physical problem, mentally, it's not challenging you, bothering you, troubling you enough to go do something about it. I happen to live in one of the most obese states in the nation. I'm quite certain that many people that are walking around with this particular condition, many of them are not doing anything about it. Nor do they care to do anything about it. Sure, would they love to wave a magic wand and not have this particular affliction? Sure, they would. But unless they're actually actively doing something about it, it bothers them so much that they are changing their diet or changing their exercise program, mentally, it doesn't trouble them. So no matter what the physical is, mentally, they're not going to go and do something about that. That's why this, this particular aspect of exercise is so fascinating to me. And it's also why our mission statement is we seek to make people feel better about being themselves because that's why that's why somebody would come to see me. Well, today we're going to take a little bit different turn on the mental side of exercise and actually discuss using exercise as a treatment for the most common mental disorder. Now, I'm sure that you are not foreign to the idea of anxiety or depression. It may be something that you struggle with yourself. I'm quite certain that you know somebody that has had uh, difficulties or struggles with anxiety and or depression, whether whether it's lifelong or whether it's periodic, short-lived, doesn't matter. I'm sure that all of us have felt feelings of anxiety, feelings of depression, and have found difficulty in dealing with it. Today, we're going to talk about some commonly known treatments as far as exercise is concerned with anxiety and depression, but more importantly, some new research out about an easier way to get involved. Let's say, I would say an easier way because it's a shorter, easier concept of fitness to get involved in to actually combat anxiety or depression. What am I talking about? Yes, I'm sounding a bit confusing, but let's let's make it easy. Let's start off like I always like to begin, and that is we're talking about anxiety. Well, what what is anxiety? Let's start off with a simple definition. Anxiety is nothing more than a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Now, I'm going to add something to that definition, and I'm going to add real or imagined. And that's a, that's a big key to what we're talking about here, uh, the real or imagined, because we create a lot of our own anxiety, or our mind creates a lot of our own anxiety. Now, I'm going to add one other definition here, too, because I think that these two go hand in hand. It's, it's very seldom that I run into anybody that is, is experiencing one without experiencing the other, and that is depression. Depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. They don't automatically have to go hand in hand, but I think you're familiar with this. You're familiar with the fact that feeling anxious or prolonged periods of feeling anxious usually comes hand in hand or brings about depression. Now, and I'm bringing up the both of these because the studies that I'm talking about today are were actually done on anxiety. But if you look through the research and you look through what they found and you, uh, you put that same metric on depression, you're going to find or do the same research for depression, you're going to find that the same things that are enhanced through this treatment 
that uh, help anxiety also help depression. So I think it's it's important for us to talk about both. And they're both such common problems. We we know plenty of people that that suffer from these afflictions. And I want to make sure that we're letting folks know that there's help. There's ways of treating this. I don't think we can go much further without talking about the causes of anxiety and or depression. Now, a reason, again, that I would cover this is, as I do with any kind of topic, I like to break down, start off with a definition, and then get into a description of what the affliction is itself. But there's a second reason I'm doing this today, and that is to make you realize or help you realize or help someone realize, someone you may know, realize that they may be suffering from anxiety. And I think it's something that is many times overlooked because we use the overused term of, I'm just feeling stressed, stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. This is something we say a lot. And if you're saying that, you find yourself saying that every single day, you find yourself being affected physically or it's affecting your life so much so on a continual basis, you may want to see somebody about anxiety. That's why I threw in the definition I thought I threw in real or imagined because it's an amazing amount of anxiety that we can create or we can fabricate due to some of the causes, causes of uh, anxiety, which are which are brought about. Uh, the first signs of it usually come from some sort of stress. I'll show you what I mean. When some of the common causes of anxiety are relationships, work, school and personal. Now think about this. As far as a relationship is concerned, usually if you're having difficulty or challenges in a relationship, it usually starts from some sort of event. It usually starts from, you know, the first time somebody talks ugly to you, the first time that you have some sort of physical abuse, the first time that you have any kind of a challenge, a breakup, or whatever, there's usually some event that starts that. And that first physical reaction to that event is stress, emotional trauma, a death in the family or an illness of a, of a loved one. Again, starts off as stress, builds to continual anxiety. Financial concerns, you know, looking and seeing that uh, the savings account isn't doing quite as well as it should, or that you've had some event that that drained savings or, or kicked off that initial downward spiral of finances. Again, stress that leads to anxiety. Substance abuse, uh, health concerns, and one of the biggest that a lot of people don't look at is change. Change itself can cause a lot of of anxiety. And just like I've talked about in the episode on stress, where you've got stress, you've got good stress and bad stress. A a wedding can be stressful uh, in a good way. I mean, you're so excited. If you think about it on your wedding day, you most likely don't remember the aspects of that day. And the reason being is you were suffering from stress. And it was, uh, it, and we can make all kinds of wonderful jokes about that as far as it being bad stress, but most like it was good stress. It was, a, it was a happy time, but that causes the tunnel vision. It causes the same effects that bad stress causes on the body. So change, making some sort of change, whether good or bad, can cause stress, which can lead to, of course, anxiety. Self-image, another big cause of anxiety. And also isolation or rejection. We're not meant to be islands, and so isolation or, or rejection can also lead to anxiety. And there's one last one. I'm going to save it for a minute, but I'm going to look at all these again and, and show you the comparisons here and why I bring up the fact that we're talking also about depression. Because difficulties in relationships, emotional trauma, financial concerns, substance abuse, health, change, self-image, isolation, or rejection, all of these, it's not hard to see where all of these can also lead to depression. That's why I think the two go hand in hand. But the last one of these causes of anxiety, I really think should be at the top. And uh, it's one that you probably would not think of, but it happens to have a lot to do with the treatment that we're going to talk about today. And that is lack of oxygen. Now, I'm sure you wouldn't think of, you know, lack of oxygen as a cause of anxiety. But think about this. When somebody is extremely anxious or has an onset of anxiety, that's kind of strange. I know that sounds strange, but think about it. An event, suddenly you become anxious. What usually happens? Well, in some small way or large way, identifiable or not, panic. Panic occurs. And if you're familiar with a panic attack, what happens? you start gasping for air. What is happening there is all the functions in your body seem to have become stressed. We have the fight or flight response kick in, which is what we now call stress. And therefore, everything starts to speed up in the body. 
when everything speeds up in the body, the first thing your body is going to want is, of course, a lot of energy. And as I've said many, many times in the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast, the key to energy is oxygen. So if your body's craving oxygen when you're panicked, then a lack of oxygen can also bring about anxiety. Now, enough of the background on all this. Okay, I've given you a definition. I've given you causes of anxiety, causes of depression. But we're here to talk about treatment, and I have some fantastic news about this because I think this is very, very simple, very easy to understand, and also very easy to start making the right steps to alleviating your anxiety. Okay, how does exercise help depression and anxiety? Now, I'm going to get into talking about the, some of the news research because I think it's fascinating on types of exercise and what new findings they found about helping anxiety. But I'm going to go over some of the things that we commonly know, but we may or may not commonly know. So let's, let's touch base on, again, how does exercise help depression and anxiety? Well, regular exercise may help ease depression and anxiety simply by releasing feel-good endorphins. It's common that a lot of people will treat anxiety with substances. And I'm not saying uh, anxiety medication as much as I'm saying uh, alcohol, uh, caffeine, any kind of a stimulant. We can go into illicit drugs and the like to talk about how people are trying to do things to make themselves feel better in order to combat anxiety and depression. Well, releasing endorphins is a fantastic way of doing that. And the best way to release endorphins is, of course, through regular exercise. The the runner's high that I've spoken about on many occasions. This is endorphins or it's a lichen to morphine. It's, it's a chemical that's created by your body that actually is a mood altering drug. It's why you can be stressed about something. Simply go for a walk. It works every single time and you can actually start feeling better. Taking your mind off of whatever you're worried about, changing your focus, getting dedicated to some sort of exercise, of course, to change your focus and take your mind off your worries and your concerns. It's quite often that I read about benefits of exercise and how, especially when it comes to mental disorders or mental concerns, and, and, it, and it always baffles me that uh, many times after doing studies and they're saying people after they, they did a, a uh, analysis or, or wrote up, usually answered questions after doing bouts of exercise on how they were feeling about their anxiety or whatever mental disorder, they'll say, you know, the, the scores will change and they'll be more positive about their treatment. In other words, they'll be more, uh, they'll have better effects from it. But many times the research is the end of it will say, we really don't want to know why exercise helps this. And I'll always, I'll always find that funny because we are well aware that one of the things that exercise does is of course increase blood flow. And increasing blood flow, we've seen this time after time after time, the studies for this have been out for as long as I've been alive, that increasing blood flow increases oxygen, which includes, increases energy, which makes you feel better. Period. Period. It's also the reason why people have back trouble and they get up in the morning and say, you know, I get up in the morning, my back's hurting. Well, once I get moving, I'm feeling better. Of course you are. You've got blood flow increased through your veins, circulation going around your body. Therefore, the muscles around the injury are warmed up and you're going to feel better. This is the same thing for the brain. Anytime you get up and get moving, anytime you increase blood flow, you're going to increase oxygen going throughout the body and that's going to increase energy. Remember what I was talking about a minute ago about the causes of anxiety and the one I told you that should be at the top and that is decreased Oxygen. Well, of course, exercise is going to increase oxygen. Yes, I am beating that to death. I'm doing it on purpose. And the reason being is because I think it's something that is a that is well researched. We know this for a fact, but it's not commonly well known that increasing oxygen throughout the body makes you feel better. Period. End of story. It works for everyone. Everyone. So we don't need to look for, for any kind of strange aspect or unique aspect of exercise to find benefits for anxiety or for, for depression, for anything of that sort. We simply can look at what we've always known, and that is increased oxygen, of course, makes you feel better. Pardon me for going off on my oxygen tangent, but I, there's one I can't, I've got to touch on. Before we get to this news research, there's one more I've got to touch on. That doesn't have to do with exercise, but it does have a lot to do with the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast and Garrett Williamson in general, because guess what else helps anxiety? I'll give you a hint. It deals with the brain. Anxiety deals with the problem in the mind. 
and your mind happens to utilize 30% of this particular substance on a daily basis. And it's when I talk about all the time. Yes, you are right, my friends. I am simply talking about <sighs> staying hydrated, drinking water. Anxiety overworks the brain, just like stress overworks the brain. Therefore, overworking the brain is going to increase the amount of water that your body needs and or is using. Since your brain uses 30% of all your water that you put in your body, then you can see where overworking it, of course, would require more. So you want to feel less stressed? As always, my favorite answer for most everything, drink water. Okay, I've been making noise about new research. Now, this is, this is interesting. This is not something I love to tell you that I, that I sit and peruse uh, medical magazines on a daily basis, but I don't. I have certain journals that I pay attention to and certain authors that I like to follow, scientists that I like to follow. I'm a big fan of the Cooper Institute and everything they come out with. I also like to follow Harvard Medical and Mayo Clinic, and there are many others that I probably should be following. But just like you, I, I get a lot of information from some common public sources. I started researching this when I saw an article in the New York Times uh, just came out uh, just a week or so ago about weight training not just exercise, but weight training as an antidote for anxiety. And, and it, some of the aspects in this article I've already covered. They talked about, of course, the basics of exercise. They talked about the fact that we already have plenty of evidence that exercise helps stave off depression and other mental ills, and that exercise can alleviate feelings of happiness and contentment. I've already spoken about that. Weight training is a form of exercise, and of course, it's going to do the same. But it brought out some other aspects that I was just fascinated about. Because it talked about one of the common problems that we see when people come to see us for starting an exercise program. As I've said many times, I said at the beginning of this podcast, and I talked about heavily in uh, podcast number 16, which is the final installment on the law of aging, which talks about mindset and how powerful the mind is. But I've brought up the fact that our mission statement is we seek to make people feel better about them being themselves. And that can be combating anxiety, that can be combating uh, problems of self-image. One of the biggest things that we deal with, and I, d I don't think I talk about enough, and that is the lack of control. I have spoken about control before. I've spoken about control when I've talked about, uh, briefly, I've talked about eating disorders. I have a podcast coming up when I'm going to get a little more into that because that's something extremely near and dear to my heart. But control many times can be, it, it has negative connotations to it. Because when we think about control when it comes to diet and exercise, those of us who are in the know and understand anorexia, bulimia, we understand that a lot of times, the majority of the times that somebody uh, is suffering from that particular affliction is because they are trying to exhibit control. Being anxious about something or triggers that lead to anorexia nervosa and bulimia are usually when somebody feels Something in their life is out of control, whether they're being dominated by a significant other, they're having problems at work, they're having athletes having difficulties from their, their coach or just from their performance in general. Many times, of course, that's coupled with a problem with self-image. And a lot of people think that anorexia nervosa and bulimia are tied to strictly tied to self-image when the majority of the time it is it is tied to a lack of control. But being in control is not always obviously not always a bad thing. In fact, being out of control leads to a lot of anxiety, which of course can lead to depression. Well, the reason I'm speaking so much about control is this was the fascinating thing that I never thought about that the researchers found in dealing with anxiety and specifically using weight training to deal with anxiety. Well, this past October, researchers from the University of Limerick, of course, that's in Ireland, <laughs> actually decided to do some studies on folks that were anxious and whether or not changes in weight training or in adding weight training would make a difference. They did this with, just to talk about how they, how they uh, set these studies up. They usually use a questionnaire and that thoroughly vet somebody on whether or not they're feeling anxious and feeling having anxiety. Then they conduct the, the, the study with a control group that doesn't do anything, and then they at all. They don't change anything in their life, and that's why they're a control group. And then they have a group that actually does whatever the testing uh, module is. In this, in this um, particular instance, it's just, of course, exercise, and they use resistance training. And then at the end, they offer that same questionnaire or one like it, 
to find out if uh, there are any changes. Of course, the control group has no change, but they found out that the testing group actually, they did 20% better on the test of anxiety. They had started with low levels of anxiety to begin with, but felt even less anxious afterwards. Now, let's get back to that idea of control. It's easy to understand if these people were not exercising prior, that because of the aforementioned benefits of exercise in dealing with anxiety, of course, they're going to feel better. But the interesting thing that, that dealt specifically with weight training was a feeling of mastery, which is a level of control. What they were seeing is they were struggling with the exercises when they began, but as they progressed in the study, they got better. They could lift more weight. They could manage the exercise. They could do more lunges. They had less difficulties completing the squat. And so therefore, they started feeling in control actually making themselves feel stronger, which is why I say that they're experiencing feelings of mastery. Now, this was also duplicated at Penn State Cancer Institute, where the, where the researchers found basically the same thing. Now, think about that. You're anxious about something going on in your life, a change going on in your life. You're anxious about a health condition that you're seeing. And this is something we see, I've seen for years in my practice, that somebody is trying to not only improve self-image or what have you, but what they're trying to do, they're trying to win at something. I actually had a client tell me that one time that got into our Catalyst program, and he said to me, he's a very, very successful, successful businessman, wonderful father, wonderful, wonderful spouse, grandfather even, and I'll never forget, he told me why he was getting into our Catalyst program. He said, you know, I've had a lot going on in my life right now, and I need a win. I need a win, and I know that if I do this, I'll have a win. I can control this. I can make this better. Well, that person actually went through a catalyst program, did have that win that he was looking for, and almost every aspect of his life got better. Now, that sounds may sound far fetched, but it's not. It's it's uh it's it's a, in fact it's a common story that you see with people beginning an exercise program. There was a lady that uh, that actually uh, was not a client of mine. She actually worked at a boxing facility that I worked out in for many years down in New Orleans. And the trainer and I talked a lot about working with different clients because it's amazing that particular sport, how mental that particular sport is. Uh, you may not know this, but a fighter's first fear when they enter the ring is actually giving pain, is actually hitting somebody and causing pain. It's not getting hit. And so John O and I sat and would talk about the mental aspect of training and what he actually experienced. I found it fascinating. But he had a, a client come in who was uh, an introvert, very bright, more or less on the realm of, a, of an accountant, I guess you'd say. And forgive me for saying that too. I don't mean any disrespect to my friends who are accountants, but very, very introverted, not domineering, extroverted type of personality, who was a government worker and had been passed over several times for promotions and basically, you know, didn't fight it, didn't combat it because this just was not her personality. Well, she happened to be on sabbatical and she had heard about John O's place and wanted to make some sort of a change in her life. Again, a very bright person had done some reading and found out that exercise benefited this, but she chose of all things boxing. Well, a, a fantastic student, as John O told me, she was, she was incredible. She, she learned the combination. She was doing everything technically perfect. And then John O put the bodysuit on and said, okay, it's time for you to start to actually get in the ring and start throwing some punches and hitting an actual target. And he noticed that when she got in the ring, though she would execute technically fantastic, she would put no power behind her punches because she was afraid of that confrontation, afraid of causing pain. And this was causing, this same type of personality was causing a lack of control of her work environment a lack of control of her life. Because of being introverted and somewhat a wallflower, so much of her life was being controlled by others. Well, Jono decided to, to use a rather unique experiment. And I think it was brilliant, uh, though it's one that I, I will not be using myself. But I thought that it was incredible. One day when he was doing some sparring in the ring with her and noticing that she still was not landing punches like she needed to, she threw a combination and left herself open. And of course, she's wearing headgear. And John O just thought, okay, I'm going to let her feel what it's like to get hit. Now, of course, John O's a very nice gentleman. He's a fantastic boxing instructor. And he wasn't out to hurt the lady, but he was out to make a change, help her break through. And so when she left herself open, he responded the way that 
he had told her that a fighter would respond, and he basically tapped her pretty good on the side of the head. Immediately, her instincts kicked in, and she responded with a combination to his head and body that sent Jono reeling. And once she had done that, she was shaking. She was visibly shaking, he, he told me, and he was stumbling backwards. He was rather shaking himself. And all of a sudden, she stopped and realized what she had done. Jono told me she broke down and cried. It was a breakthrough, and everything started pouring out. She started actually talking to him about the problems that she had had at work and what have you. They continued the session, and he said from then on, the sparring sessions completely changed. She was now taking control. She was now standing up for herself. She was now executing the punches and throws as she knew she was supposed to and as she knew that she had the control and permission to do. She had given herself that kind of permission. She had finally started to execute control, executing a mastery of what she had learned. After the sabbatical, she not only went up and got one promotion, she actually was promoted twice and said that she is a completely changed individual. She's not the wallflower she used to be. And that was all because of a mental breakthrough through an exercise where she basically had mastered something and made that slight, slight switch in her brain dealing with control. And this is what was so interesting to me about this study. I went and read the study itself, and I thought it was fascinating because they used some very simple exercises. As I've told you about my favorite study that Ken Cooper did called what I call the nursing home study, they used very simple exercises to elicit change. And this study did the same thing. I mean, just some simple lifts, some body weight stuff, mostly squats and lunges. And it was amazing how the subjects not only increase that, that oxygen flow, increase that energy level going through the body, increase that blood flow, and started feeling better, but they started feeling in control, feeling a mastery. They were actually improving upon the exercises. Therefore, they were getting better at something. Therefore, their anxiety across the board got better. Well, how do you get involved in this? Well, it is simple. It is very simple. I mean, starting everything from, you know, taking it from a cardiovascular benefit of exercise as far as anxiety is concerned, going for a walk. I've told this story many times where when I was opening Personal Edge, the challenges I was going through of actually starting a physical plant, even though I'd had my own business for years, was a, a major, major challenge. A lot of things that I'd, I'd never experienced. And I would go out for a walk every single morning strictly to deal with the anxiety that I was feeling. By the end of the walk, I felt better because I had endorphins released, I had oxygen increased and what have you. So therefore, uh, the exercise had benefited my anxiety. That's one thing you can do. But if you really want to go for this feeling of mastery, conquering this, making this change, I highly recommend resistance training because it is something that can be, that can be objectively measured. You know, am I going up on bench press? Am I lifting a heavier weight than I was before? Am I getting better? Am I able to do more repetitions of this exercise than another exercise? Now, you can see that in cardiovascular, but there is a, there's a different feeling when it comes to resistance training. And for that, of course, as always, I'm going to recommend, give us a call. We're more than glad to help you set up the right type of program with measurable changes so that you can start to feel and elicit that control that you may need in order to deal with anxiety. Obviously, having a master's degree in fitness management and being a personal trainer for 29 years, I am a huge fan of fitness. But when, when you know the problems it can solve and the changes it can make to someone's life, it makes you even, it makes you even happier to be involved as a, uh, an instructor of this particular uh, modality, I guess you'd say. Folks, I appreciate you listening to me. If you're interested in any more of this information, feel free to contact me at Garrett, G-A-R-R-E-T-T, -T, at personaledgefitness.com. You can call us at the Mobile location. Uh, I'm typically there during the week at 251-341-0927. And you can reach out to our Eastern Shore manager, Josh. He'd be more than glad to, to help you at 251-651-0927. Check out our, our website at personaledgefitness.com. You can contact us there or, of course, through our Facebook page, Personal Edge Fitness. Combating anxiety and depression with exercise, especially resistance training. One more way that we help you find your own level of wellness. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Personal Edge Fitness Podcast with Garrett Williamson. Subscribe now and be a part of the show by calling 251 251 
278 edge or message us on facebook and instagram at personal edge fitness or at team pe on twitter and visit us at personaledgefitness.com